Hello everyone and welcome. Many argue the V10 era of Formula One was the era of the best engines. And when I started digging into it, surprisingly these engines are still insanely impressive 20 years later, even compared against modern standards. Now before we go off the deep end reminiscing over 20,000 RPM and talking about how they're the greatest engines of all time, let's lower expectations. And to do so we're going to use the Ferrari engine from 2004. So back in 2004 the Ferrari engine was a 3 liter naturally aspirated V10 engine making as much as 920 horsepower at 19,000 RPM. Okay, but how much torque was it making? Well, it's a simple equation to find out horsepower times 5252 divided by RPM and we can find out that it is making just 200 54 pound-feet of torque, which, okay, we don't have any context, let's provide a little context. A Chevy Spark EV, one of the dorkiest electric cars of all time, 400 pound-feet of torque. All right, but that's an electric car, right? Not really a fair comparison. How about a Honda Accord, simple old sedan with a two-liter turbo engine? 273 pound-feet of torque. So more than, you know, this incredible engine that we all hate from you know the early 2000s of being this engineering marvel only 254 pound-feet of torque well realistically no production car engine uh, of all time can match the performance of what this engine was capable of okay so why share these silly facts about torque well it helps illustrate and show that power is truly what matters and that torque without context is really a meaningless thing to kind of compare so I think we can all agree you know a Ferrari F1 car is going to be faster uh, than a Honda Accord and yet you can show that oh you know this has more torque right so it's gonna be quicker now torque doesn't really matter power is the important thing another thing slightly disingenuous comparison because for the Ferrari engine we're looking at torque at peak peak horsepower, not its peak torque. Though the number will probably only be slightly higher uh, and it will occur at probably a lower RPM. Not a huge difference, but let's do an apples to apples comparison using one of the most advanced naturally aspirated engines, arguably the most advanced currently sold today uh, in a production car, which is the four liter boxer six cylinder in the Porsche GT3 RS. It is producing 518 horsepower at 8,500 RPM. Again, we do that same math to find what is its torque at its peak horsepower, and that ends up being about 320 pound-feet. Again, more than that Ferrari engine, uh, and also if you want to know, you know, what is the comparison of that at peak horsepower versus peak torque, it's only a slight difference. So again, I don't feel that uncomfortable sharing this number, even though that is not the true peak torque of the engine. But again, apples to apples comparison with the Porsche, the Porsche does have more torque, though it is a larger engine. So in order to fairly compare the two engines, we need to talk about torque per liter. Now, while the adults at the adult table with their fancy adult clothing and whatever, uh, you know, they got calculators, they're nerdy engineers, they're talking brake mean effective pressure. At the kids table, we don't need that nonsense, we're just trying to understand the basics, so we are talking torque per liter. Effectively the same thing, way easier to understand. If you really want to understand BMAP, I've got a separate video covering all the details on it. So torque per liter, what is it? Well, think about how a one liter engine. If you're to take that Ferrari engine and turn it into just one liter, if you take that Porsche engine and turn it into just one liter, how much torque would that have? Torque per liter of that engine. So for the Porsche, that number is about 80 pound feet per liter. For the Ferrari F1 engine, it's about 85 pound feet per liter. And this isn't even the best Formula One engine of that era. There are some making as high as a thousand horsepower. Even Ferrari had engines in 2005 that were slightly more powerful at the same RPM. So not even the best versus arguably today's best engine for sale. And you might say, well, Jason, what about the Aston Martin Valkyrie with its insane engine, you know, super high revving or the Gordon Murray T50 with its insane engine? Both of these have lower torque per liter, lower brake mean effective pressure than the Porsche engine. So, you know, these multi-million dollar cars cannot keep up with the technology that Porsche employs within their engine. So props to Porsche for doing it for much less money. 
Now, production cars do have some big factors working against them. Two of the major ones being emissions. For example, with the Porsche, you have to have this more restrictive exhaust. So, of course, that means less power. And then longevity, right? The Porsche has to last, you know, 100,000 miles, 200,000 miles versus this Ferrari F1 engine, you know, needs to only last a race or two. So, not an insane life to it versus the Porsche. You have to be much more conservative with your tuning because you need that thing to last a really long amount of time. Even still, it is pretty insane that an engine from 20 years ago cannot be beat by today's best technology in production cars. Okay, so what about horsepower per liter? And usually this really isn't that fair of a comparison unless we're just talking about two naturally aspirated engines. In the case of the Porsche GT3, we have about 130 horsepower per liter versus the Ferrari F1 engine, over 300 horsepower per liter. Absolutely absurd. So you can even compare this to today's best turbo engines and they get nowhere near it. So if you look at the Koenigsegg tiny friendly giant engine, when it's running on gasoline, it's making 250 horsepower per liter, 500 horsepower out of a little two liter engine. And if you cheat a little bit, you run on ethanol, well then you're getting 300 horsepower per liter. But even still, it can't match it. And again, this isn't the best naturally aspirated engine out there. So the Ferrari F1 engine doing better than today's best production car using a ton of boost. Like it's insane how much power per liter it is making. Nothing today can beat a 20 year old naturally aspirated engine in horsepower per liter absolutely absurd. All right, so how is that possible? Now, I think the easiest way to understand how an engine is making so much power is to look at how much air is actually going through that engine and measure that air. So in other words, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the swept volume of the piston over the course of a minute and see how much air can we pull in within that minute. How much air is going through that engine? Because with that amount of air, you burn a certain amount of fuel, you make a certain amount of power. Now, in order to understand how much air goes through that engine, we take our displacement, we multiply that by our RPM, and then we're going to divide that by two because this is a four-stroke engine. So that means we only have one intake stroke for every four strokes. In other words, only one intake for every two RPM. Okay, so for the Porsche, we've got a four-liter engine. We're multiplying that by 8,500 RPM, and that divided by two means we have 17 thousand liters per minute of air going through this engine. For the Ferrari F1 engine, we have 28,500 liters of air going through this engine per minute. So 68% more air than the Porsche and it's making 78% more horsepower. So you can see with all that additional air, it is able to make more power. Now you can actually get more air than what I've shown. And if you look at the F1 regulations, they provide a clue as to how, even though at the time supercharging was prohibited. But listen to the definition of supercharging. Increasing the weight of the charge of the fuel air mixture in the combustion chamber over the weight induced by normal atmospheric pressure, ram effect, and dynamic effects in the intake and or exhaust system by any means whatsoever. So you can see there's a bit of an exception there. And as an example of how you can put this to work, Sam Collins in Race Car Engineering wrote, at the end of the straight at the Shanghai circuit, where the car is traveling at close to 330 kilometers per hour with DRS open, the air pressure hitting the air filter will be close to 1,070 millibar. Normal ambient air pressure is around 1,020 millibar. This means the engine produces around 5% more power, equivalent to 40 brake horsepower than at walking speed. Now, Porsche is also using intake tricks to raise the pressure inside the cylinders above what is available from the atmosphere. But what does Ferrari's engine do differently to rev so high? Now, 10 years ago, when I was a real engineer, I carried around with me this little pocket ruler and our calibration engineers ensured its accuracy as of March 2014. So I used this pocket ruler to give you an accurate drawing to scale of what the bore and stroke of the GT3 engine versus the Ferrari Formula One engine look like. So this is looking inside our cylinder basically and seeing how much does that piston move within the cylinder. As you can see in the GT3, 
81.5 millimeters, more than double that of the Ferrari F1 engine. So the Ferrari F1 engine, look at that, the piston's only moving this tiny little distance back and forth. So despite the fact that it's revving extremely high, the distance that piston travels per RPM is fairly low. So the overall distance these pistons travel is actually very similar. What does that mean? Well, it means you have similar piston speeds. So you can do the math and calculate it for the Porsche GT3. That number, the average piston speed is 24.5 meters per second, and for the Ferrari, 25.2 meters per second. So nearly identical, even though this is revving way, way faster. So that's showing the advantage of using a short stroke. Now, an underappreciated art and science of these old school Formula One engines is just the amount of research and knowledge that has to go into the materials and design of every single part, ensuring that you don't run into their natural frequencies and just destroy this engine. So the frequency at which these different objects want to vibrate out of control and then just cause catastrophic failure with your engines. So a great example of this and a simple one to understand are the springs that are used. So F1, they use pneumatic valves using air pressure rather than mechanical springs. So if you look in the Porsche engine, you'd see a mechanical spring. So you have that little finger follower, your camshaft presses down on the valve and a mechanical spring forces that valve back up when the portion of the cam lobe isn't directly acting on it. So it's simple, it's reliable, it works, uh, but up at a certain RPM, you start to lose control of that spring and it becomes unpredictable. You have valve float, you no longer control the position of that valve. That's obviously a terrible thing to do. If a piston hits it, the piston wins and you're not gonna have great airflow. So what do they do in Formula One? Well, they use air pressure. So you use air pressure so that you always have that return spring. You don't have to worry about that natural frequency, that vibration of the spring and losing its control. And you can have control control up to these crazy engine speeds like 20,000 RPM. It's complicated, you have leaks, uh, it's not gonna have a long life, but in Formula One, it's like, who cares, right? The engine only has to last a few hours at a time and then you can refill uh, you know, that air pressure in there and not worry about it. So it's not that big of a deal in a racing environment that it's not, you know, this longevity focus isn't there. All right, so let's move on to where we are today. So in the pursuit of ensuring that Formula One is relevant to today's road cars, we now have 1.6 six liter, 90 degree V6 engines. They are turbocharged, they are hybrid, uh, but they have a very rigid rule set. You've got 80 millimeter bore, you've got four valve. Everyone has to do all of that, right? You don't really have much leeway in where you can change these different parameters. They all must be exactly that. Uh, another thing, you know, just looking at some of the valve train components, you can't have variable valve timing. You can't have variable valve lift. You can't use variable geometry turbochargers. So if you look at the rules, Everything basically ensures that you have to optimize this engine for one RPM, and that happens to be around 10,500, about 11,000 RPM, where you can't use any more fuel beyond that point, so it really becomes pointless to do so. So they all become optimized for this single RPM, all using you know kind of these archaic rules that really today's production cars are not bound by, and as a result, it means these engines are not at all relevant to what is on the road. But regardless, they are very impressive in how much power they put out. So a 1.6 liter in Formula One today, making about 850 horsepower. In other words, 530 horsepower per liter. Of course, it is turbocharged, but a much higher number uh, than the old days of Formula One. And I did kind of lie to y'all when I said that there's nothing in production today uh, that can beat that Ferrari F1 car. If you look at the AMG one, which is a Formula One derived engine used in a production car, okay, it has 350 horsepower per liter for the combustion engine portion of that vehicle. So it can be, you know, a Formula One engine from 20 years ago. Is it actually a production car? I don't know, did I lie to y'all? Maybe so, my bad. Now, to me, one of the most important relevant to road car stories to come out of Formula One is the fact that they want to use 100% sustainable fuels by 2026. And so to me, it's like, okay, well then why do we need this rigid, irrelevant 1.6 liter V6 if the fuel is going to be sustainable anyway? So imagine, you know, a screaming V10 going down the main straight and then being like, hey, that's net zero carbon emissions. That's actually an incredible statement that you can make while still using a piece of technology that's kind of old school, but also 
you can make it more modern and you can make it really cool. To me, that seems like a way sweeter way to go than using these tiny little turbo engines uh, that kind of just go like, man, you can't really, you know, they're just not as exciting, okay? Now, I'm gonna answer my own question because, you know, why not? So why shouldn't we do this? Well, if you look at the trend in Formula One, back in the old days, you could refuel, you could use as much fuel as you want. 2013, they're down to 160 kilograms of fuel. 2020, 100 kilograms of fuel. And by 2026, they're targeting around 70 kilograms of fuel. So you can see the trend, right? Use less fuel. Now, why would that be the trend uh, if we're going towards sustainable fuels? So here's a quote from the European journal Combustion Engines. In 2030, the cost of energy needed to power a car with an SI engine and e-fuel will be nearly four times higher than in the case of an electric vehicle. So if synthetic fuels are going to be relevant whatsoever, we need to make sure that combustion engines are as efficient as is possible to ensure that the pricing of synthetic fuels makes absolutely any sense to actually use. And so the goal of reducing fuel consumption to complete the same task is a worthy goal in demonstrating this technology. But it's like, you know, racing is always kind of irrelevant in terms of road cars. Uh, there's so many series out there that, you know, don't try at all to have any relevancy with road cars. And it's like Formula E already exists if you want to push electric cars and show what technology can do. So it's like, what are we showcasing here with Formula One? Like plug-in hybrids? Like it's a, it's a strange space that it's in. So it's like, I don't know, maybe use V10s and synthetic fuel. But it's a difficult position uh, I get. If you enjoyed this, there are two really cool videos I'd recommend checking out the first on how the tiny little 1.6 liter power units used in Formula One today are capable of making a thousand horsepower and then the second one on how these power units are going to change for 2026. So the engines are going to be making significantly less power but the power unit overall still making a thousand horsepower. Any questions or comments feel free to leave those below. Thanks for watching.